And it's in the goodness of God and the truth of that statement we approach the scriptures this morning. Um, What a great way and a great prayer and praise to submit to the Lord before we approach his word. Uh, if you don't know me, my na- I'm not Todd. Uh, my name is Tim Tucker. I normally stand right there and uh, sing and play guitar, lead worship here. Um, I'm used to having a cord connected to me all the time. So now, now that this thing is wireless, so if I get rangy, that's, that's why. Um, I, in my mind, that was going to be funnier. Uh, anyway, if you don't know me, uh, I, I lead worship here. Me and my wife, Sarah, have been here for seven years. We have three daughters. Olivia is nine, Emma is seven, and Charlotte is four. Um, Sarah is pregnant with, uh, with our son, Ezra. And so um, just due to some slight concern and the uh, wonders of medical technology, we are planning to have him on Tuesday. So if I am extra jumpy and high strung, or if I'm all over the place, that's why. We are super, super excited. But at least this morning, at least my sermon has a point. So um, and if that wasn't funny, you weren't paying attention last week. Uh, anyway, so at our house, when we when we're preparing to, 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 to welcome a new baby to our home, there's always like three or four weeks of anxiousness where like at any moment she could go into labor and the baby could be born. So it's like you're constantly like just waiting and it's exciting. There's anxiousness, but it's excitement. And so I tend to be kind of anxious and high strung anyway. And so we, in an attempt to curve that, we do a jigsaw puzzle. So we're the kind of people that like our kitchen table or our dining room table is rarely clean. It's just, it's the catch-all of our house. And so it's just like always full of stuff. We're just, that's, that we're those people. And so we clear off the table and we do a jigsaw puzzle just to give us something to do while we're sitting and waiting. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been doing a jigsaw puzzle on our um, dining room table and... Um, You know, everybody, jigsaw puzzles are kind of like sunflower seeds. Everyone has their own technique that they've like perfected and they're proud of it. And, you know, the same result, you know, is to finish the puzzle, but everybody kind of has their own approach and their own technique. So for us, we, uh, you know, we, we, the, I guess the four of us, me, Sarah, and the two older girls, we sit down and we get all the pieces out and we're digging through to find the edge pieces and the corner pieces. And it's like a competition to find the corner pieces. I always win. And so we find that, and then, you know, we get the, ed- the edge pieces all put together. Then we start looking for, you know, various elements, depending on what, you know, the picture of the puzzle is. But there's always this moment where like halfway through the puzzle, you've like got that one piece. Everyone who's ever done a jigsaw puzzle has that one piece. And that one piece, no matter how much you look at the picture and how much you look at the puzzle and how much you look at the picture and you look at that piece and you look at the puzzle, you go back and forth. You're just like, this piece does not go with this puzzle. They made a mistake. It doesn't fit. It doesn't go anywhere. And so you've, you set that piece aside and you continue working on the puzzle and you've looked at the picture of that puzzle so much you almost don't even have to look at it because you've memorized it, you've learned it and you're going along, you're going along and then all of a sudden there's this little spot that you've been working on this little thing, whatever it is. The particular picture, puzzle we're working on is like, has like a bunch of camera stuff. And so it's like, okay, I'm working to put this one camera together. Then all of a sudden you're like, ooh, I know what goes right there. It's that one piece. And it's, it's hard when that one piece, when you're only staring at that one little tiny piece to understand, it doesn't even make sense to understand where it fits because it's just obscure and the detail, it doesn't give you much to go off of. I feel like that's kind of that's the approach to the book of Esther. The name of God is not spoken or mentioned or written in the book of Esther. And honestly, if you just skim it, it's a great story. Everything kind of works out okay-ish, but there's no mention of God. And it honestly, on the surface, it really doesn't feel like God intervenes or is even there at all. 
And so for us, we just, we have to ask the question when we approach the book of Esther is what do we do when God isn't there? And I want to argue with you this morning that there is hope when God is silent. And so before we get right into the book of Esther, I want us to back up a little bit and see a little bit of that whole puzzle before we zoom in on this little piece. So if you don't know much about Jewish history, we we refer to this time as the exile. But in reality, the Jewish people had kind of always been in exile. They had 200 years of kingdom reign in Palestine, but they spent 400 years in slavery in Egypt. They've kind of been all over the place. So really you could think that they've just kind of always been in exile, always searching for a home. And so the Jewish people land in the promised land after the Exodus. God gives them a king, King Saul. King Saul is, um, he is what you would think of with a king. He is a mighty warrior, but he does not trust God and he disobeys him. And because of that, his lineage and his dynasty is removed. So then God raises up David and David is this great king. He is the man after God's own heart. Finally, I mean, he, he has it all. He plays the harp. He, he, he is a great warrior. I mean, finally, they got it together. They put the worship leader in charge <laughs> until he has an affair with his neighbor and then murders her husband to cover it up. His son Solomon, when he dies, leaves the kingdom divided and split. So they split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom of Israel has 19 kings, all of which who do evil in the sight of God. The southern kingdom of Judah has a few good guys, a lot of eh, and a bunch of bad. And so eventually, the kingdom, the empire of Assyria attacks, destroys the capital city of Judah, Samaria. They take them away. They destroy. The kingdom of Israel is no more. Then here comes the Babylons, and the, Babylon, the Babylonians take and destroy, or overtake the Assyrians and set their sights on the kingdom of Judah. And through a series of three different conflicts, they destroy the city of Jerusalem. Its people are spread, and many of them go back in exile in Babylon. And this is the period we think of as the exile, when the Jewish people have been taken from their home. The home has been destroyed. There is nothing left, and they've been taken, carried away into Babylon. This is where we find um, Daniel um, taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. That lasts for a few years until King Cyrus the Persian comes on the scene, and he conquers um, the Babylonians, and he is kind to the Jews. He is fairly understanding. He does not really hold them in captivity. He, in fact, allows a group to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. So Zerubbabel takes a group of Jews back to um, Jerusalem to rebuild the temple on Cyrus's dime. And I mean, what a name, Zerubbabel. I mean, that was not in consideration for our naming Ezra. Um, (laughs) Then later, Ezra makes several trips and Nehemiah then goes back to rebuild the city walls. And so this is kind of a back and forth thing for several years. This, right in between those two events, is where we find ourselves in the book of Ezra. And I think it's worthy to note that the Jews living in Persia in the book of Esther, who are still there, are there by choice. They had the chance to go back, and they stayed. They live relatively comfortable with little conflict. Um, I mean, it's, it's the capital city of the most powerful empire on earth. Th- they're doing okay. Until we find the dis- this disagreement and conflict between Mordecai and Haman. Haman is a, um, basically an advisor to um, King Xerxes. And Xerxes is on the throne of Persia. He is like the most powerful man 
on earth, but he is easily manipulated when drunk. Um, And so he finds himself in this situation where Haman has manipulated him to decree that all of the Jews in Persia be killed. And so Haman has worked out his plan. Everything is going his way. And this is where we find ourselves in Esther chapter 4. I got Ezra, I got the name Ezra on my my brain. Esther chapter 4. King Xerxes, um, in Esther, he's called Hazarus, but I'm going to call him Xerxes because it's just a way cooler name. So here we are, Esther chapter 4. The very end of chapter 3, Haman has, the decree has gone out into Susa and all of the empire of Persia that all the Jews are going to be killed. Haman and King Xerxes sit down to drink. They are partying, they are relaxing, they are doing what drinking people do. And it says that all of Susa was thrown into confusion. And this is where we find ourselves in Esther chapter 4. So I'm going to read Esther uh, chapter 4, 1 through probably about 8. It says, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. He went into the midst of the city and he cried with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and decree had reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened and and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasures for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her and command her to go to the king and to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. So the question this morning is this, what do we do when God is silent? Mordecai, Esther, and the Jews are in their moment of distress. It is pure chaos. The decree goes out really seemingly out of nowhere that all of a sudden, all of the Jews are going to be killed. And so everyone is thrown into distress and pain and pure chaos. And God seems to be absent. So the question is this morning, what do we do when God is, isn't there? So Mordecai mourns, and he laments. He takes his clothes off. He puts on his sackcloth and ashes and stands in the city square and cries out a loud and bitter cry. He makes a big scene. And for us, this is kind of strange. Um, Sackcloth, really? Like, I... I, we don't have anything close to sackcloth. I mean, the closest thing I have to sackcloth is like that old pair of sweatpants I wear around the house that are like disintegrating. But we, this, is, this is not how we deal with our mourning and our grief and our distress. I think for us, it's odd. I mean, we, we as church people, we come and we put our happy faces on when we come to church. We have inward distress and pain And instead of lamenting, we stuff it away and we put our happy church face on and we sing songs and we listen to a sermon and we go home. I think we've lost as a church, as a people, we've lost the art 
of lamenting, I think it's worth noting that they don't, it's not just Mordecai. They lament together. It's this collective petitioning of God in their distress. Mordecai expresses outwardly his inward pain and distress. I want to read Psalm 74 this morning. You can, you can turn there and follow me if you'd like. I'm going to read the whole thing. I think it's important for us to see how to lament correctly. Psalm 74 says this, O oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pastor? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees. All of its carved wood they broke down with hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name. Bringing it down to the ground, they said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. They burned all the meeting places in the land of God. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, and there is no one among us who knows how long. How long, O oh God, is the foe to scoff? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Yet God, my king, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open the springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly lights and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, O Lord, how the enemy scoffs and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not deliver the soul of your dove to, dove to the wild beast. Do not forget your life of the poor forever. Have regard for the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of inhabitants of violence. Let none of the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, defend your cause. Remember how the foolish scoff at you all day. Do not forget the clamor of your foes, the uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. I think it's important for us to see how to lament correctly. I mean, a, a good portion of the book of Psalms is lamenting. There's even a special book in the Bible that's all lamenting called Lamentations. It's something we don't necessarily do. And I think sometimes we're afraid to question God. But I think that's okay. I think it's okay to question God as long as we're willing to hear his answer. The psalmist Ahaz says, Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why do you sit there with your hands in your pockets waiting? But yet he says, you are a God of old who works salvation in the midst of the earth. I've kind of had a weird year. Um, sometimes in life, like everything on the outside is going horribly, but then like on the inside, you're like, you're just like feeling spiritually filled up. You're pressing forward. You're just feeling the Lord speak in your quiet times and you're just hearing from him and you're pressing forward amidst the outward distress. Then sometimes we kind of the opposite. We're like everything on the outside is going great, but then on the inside we just fall flat. I feel like this year I kind of felt like that. Like everything on the outside is great. I mean, there's a, no problems at all. But yeah, on the inside I'm just, just felt flat. But I'm thankful I have not had to bear that burden alone. Our church, we have D groups. So a D group is a group of three to five-ish um, 
peer-to-peer group where we um, share our burdens, we share our, we, we hold each other accountable, and we study the scriptures and pray. And with this group, I've been able to lament the absence, the silence of God in my life. But I have not had to bear that burden alone. They have borne it with me. Born, birthed, born, barren, whatever the word is. Bared, bearded. I have not had to bear that on my own. I've had a group of men who hold me up when I can't hold myself up. I, imagine if we were a church who lamented well, who didn't always just put our happy face on when we came into church and we were willing to say, look, man, everything looks great out here, but in here it's just falling apart. I need some help. I need to lament. I need to cry out to God. I need to ask God, why, why aren't you speaking? Why can't I hear you? Imagine if we were a church who lamented and bare, bore it bore each other's burdens together, who lamented our sin, who lamented the lost, and we did that well. They cried out, Mordecai cries out to God in a loud voice. The people lamented and fasted and prayed. There's a lot we could talk about with fasting, but I do want to say this. There is something unique and powerful about taking, removing a a normal everyday thing from your life, something that you pretty much depend on, removing that from your life for a specific reason to focus and to pray and to hear from God. There is something unique and powerful in fasting. But it makes me think of others who in their distress and in their pain that didn't hear from God. I mean, I think of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob. His brothers sold him into slavery, and somehow he ends up in Potiphar's house, and he's in charge of everything until Potiphar's wife accuses him of, of, of pursuing her, and there's this um, disagreement, or not really disagreement, but she accuses him, and Potiphar throws him in jail, and he's in jail for two years, I'm sure if I was in that situation, I would be whining and complaining, angry and bitter towards God. But yet, that's not what Joseph did. Joseph pressed forward, and it says that the Lord was with him, and the Lord blessed everything he did. And I think Egyptian prison probably wasn't that nice. They probably didn't have HBO and yard time. But yet Joseph waited when God didn't speak. I think of Jesus on the cross, the Son of God. And he cries out and says, God, why did you leave me here? Why have you, why have you forsaken me? And God doesn't answer. But Jesus knew he was here for a purpose, and he knew what that purpose was, and he pressed forward. He kept on keeping on. So it kind of leaves us with the question of like what we should do. But I think I, I originally wanted to, before I thought of the question, what should I do, this other question came to my mind. Why is God silent? I mean, I think that we read that. We read the book of Esther. We experience silence from God, and we want to ask that question. We want to ask God, why are you being silent? But I think the honest truth is we just don't know. We can never answer that question. I think there are seasons where God is silent, and that's just the way God operates. We can't answer the question of why. I think better we should ask, what should we do when God is silent? I think the first thing we should do when God is silent is to get quiet. If we were to be as quiet as we absolutely could in this room, technically, Blake's heart is making noise, like an audible noise. If we got as absolutely quiet as we possibly could in this room, we could never hear it. 
There's just always, complete silence is, is not found in nature. I don't know, maybe we couldn't hear it just because he's heartless, I don't know. <laughs> but there's, it's, true silence is n- not naturally occurring. There's always noise of some kind. There's always sound pressure on our ears all the time. It's just the way we, it's the way nature works. In 2015, Microsoft built a room that is the most silent place on earth. So sound level is measured by decibels. So it starts at zero and goes up. So zero decibels is the threshold for human hearing. The anechoic room that Microsoft built in 2015 is like negative 20 decibels. And so that is like nearly atomic. It's like sound on an atomic level. It is the single quietest place on earth. The longest a person has ever sat in this room is like 40 minutes. Because when you enter this room, it's basically a big concrete room and no sound from the outside can get in. But then also on the inside, they've constructed it in such a way that there's no sound that reflects off of the walls or the ceiling or the floor. And so when you go in there, we're used to hearing, like you're hearing my voice from the speakers, but then you're also hearing it bouncing off the walls. The same thing is true when you're in your kitchen. We're just, that's the way we're used to hearing things. So when you go in this room, it is so dead silent that the sound of your heart beating is like deafening. They say you can hear your heart beating as clearly, and you can hear your lungs, and you can even hear like your joints moving and stuff, maybe some more than others. Um, I'm not saying anything about any of you. But the silence is deafening. The sound that Blake's heart in this room is making the same noise, the same level of sound here as it would be there. Except in that setting, when we're quiet, you can hear it. Sometimes I think when we can't hear God speaking, we don't hear from him, we need to stop talking. We need to be quiet to hear his whisper. We need to quiet the noise and distraction all around us so we can hear him speaking. Just because we can't hear it doesn't mean he's not talking. We also need to keep on keeping on. If God's given you a calling, follow it. That's what Jesus did. God, gave, God had him a purpose and a calling, and he kept on keeping on even when God was silent. If you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with him, you have a calling. And so even in seasons when you can't hear, keep on keeping on. Follow the calling that God has given you. We keep moving forward when God is silent because there is hope. There is hope when God is silent. And we have reason to have hope when God is silent because God keeps his promises. Even in Genesis chapter three, like 38 milliseconds after Adam and Eve had sinned, God already had a plan for their redemption. One would come who would crush the head of the serpent. God promised to Abraham to be the father of a nation, a nation who would bless the earth. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. That's a promise. God keeps his promises no matter what. Just because we can't hear him doesn't mean he isn't speaking. Just because we can't see him working doesn't mean his fingerprints are not all over the chaos. And the silence is temporary. Let's not forget that the exile of the Jews is not the only exile, and it's not the first exile. The first exile was Adam and Eve who got removed from the garden because of their sin. And we share in that exile. We are separated from God because of our sin. And even for those of us, if you know Jesus, we have been restored. Our soul has been restored. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. But we're not home yet. 
We still live and function and struggle in exile. But it's temporary. One of my favorite scriptures is in Revelation 21. It says that the dwelling place of God is with man. The first time I really read that, it just, it just, you have those moments when you're studying scripture and it just, it just whacks you across the face. The dwelling place of God is with man. He has designed us to dwell with us. There's hope when God is silent. So Mordecai and Esther, they lament and they fast before God who doesn't clearly intervene. I think when we really look closely, we can obviously see God's sovereignty and his fingerprints all over the book of Esther. But it's not clear. I mean, there's no flashy miracles or pillar of fire no raising from the dead, no fourth man standing in the fire, none of it. But I think the fact that God is silent in the book of Esther gives us hope because our lives really, our day-to-day lives really look more like the book of Esther than a lot of other books of the Bible. My life certainly doesn't look like Exodus. No pillar of fire by night, cloud by day, The Lord doesn't speak audibly. But we always, but I know that God is working. Because I see his fingerprints all over my life. And his sovereignty all over my life, even though sometimes it's hard to see. And our D groups were studying um, Acts. And in Acts, we kind of all, when we got together to, to kind of talk about what we had read and studied, we kind of all had the same thought. Like in Acts, I mean, they just, the Spirit leads in a way that is powerful. I mean, I mean it's like as clear as Google Maps. I mean, step-by-step step direction that the, the, the Spirit led the apostles. And we kind of all had the same thought, like, man, like, how do we get some of that? How do, how, does the, how do we get the Spirit to speak? How do we hear the Spirit speak clearly? And we all had this agreement that we all know there's things, particular things the Lord has called us to and set us out for. But a lot of times it's not this clear direction. It's a little piece from here and a little whisper of the Spirit over here and a, and a quiet time scripture over here and a word from a brother or sister over here and a word from in a sermon or in a song and we kind of put all those things together and in the end we know like I know the Lord is calling me to this whatever it may be and sometimes we all and we all kind of agreed sometimes we say and I know the Lord I know for sure the Lord is calling me to do this thing I can't tell you why but I know And I think that's often how the Lord speaks and how the Lord works in our lives. It's like that little puzzle piece that until you, it doesn't make sense until you've seen the whole picture and you spend time with the whole picture that that little piece makes sense. And in fact, the puzzle is incomplete without it. We have hope when God is silent because God keeps his promises just because we can't hear him speak doesn't mean he's not speaking we have reason to press forward when we can't hear from God because that's what Jesus did there is hope when God is silent let's pray